Hello and good afternoon. Welcome back to the 2023 Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. My name is Brian Flock. I'm the State Forest Lands Program Manager for Washington Conservation Action. Uh, and we're really excited to see you all again for our second day, Forest and Carbon Science for Management in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, as we formally start our program, it is our commitment at Washington Conservation Action to acknowledge the land that we occupy. We know that a land acknowledgement is the bare minimum. We must also listen to tribal nations and act in consultation and collaboration. In the Americas and across the world, we are on the stolen land that indigenous people have stewarded since time immemorial. Acknowledging this truth is important. In Seattle, where WCA is based, we are on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the ancestral land of the Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and Duwamish. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all Indigenous communities, past, present, future. We express our gratitude as guests and thank the original and current stewards of this land. We would not be here without their guardianship and connection to the earth. We also encourage all of you to go beyond simply learning about the original stewards and inhabitants, but also to commit to action like consulting and working with tribal communities ensuring space at your decision-making tables, giving land back to tribes, protecting the environment and salmon and the tribal cultures that depend on them. It means electing officials and judges that understand tribal sovereignty, supporting native-led priorities such as land sovereignty, upholding treaty and land rights, and so much more. The sovereignty, well-being, cultures, and languages of indigenous peoples are born of their homelands and that makes these lands and waters precious to Native communities. All of us have the responsibility to treat them with the respect and care they deserve and to steward them carefully for the next generations. Please do your part. Thank you. I also want to uh, extend another thanks, a big shout out uh, to our sponsors for this uh, conference. EcoTrust, uh, EFM Investments, Pacific Forest Trust, Sustainable Northwest and Vibrant Planet Data Commons. We simply could not pull this conference off without you, uh, and we greatly appreciate your support. As I mentioned, today's session is Forest and Carbon Science for Management in the Pacific Northwest. We have four presentations and some time for questions and discussion after each. We begin with a talk by Max Wright from Conservation International titled, Not Just Carbon, capturing and valuing all the climate benefits of forests. Followed at 2.05 by increasing carbon storage in the working forests of Canada and the United States, given by Amy Clark Eagle of the Forest Stewardship Council, United States. At 3.05, we'll have a panel discussion with Jefferson County Commissioner Heidi Eisenhower, Catherine Kopis of Olympic Forest Coalition, and Cindy Jane from the Jefferson County Climate Action Committee, presenting lessons learned in their talk assessing a community's greenhouse gas impact from forests and trees using the LEARN tool. We'll conclude with a recorded talk from the Department of Natural Resources Commissioner of Public Lands, Hilary Franz, 
followed by a brief remark to close the day from our CEO, Alyssa Macy. Before we jump into our presentations for the day, a couple of quick reminders. These presentations are being recorded uh, and they will be posted after the conference for registered participants to view. If you'd like to submit questions to the speakers, please do so using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our session facilitators will be sorting through the questions and leading the discussion after each presentation. If you're having any technical issues with Zoom or the format uh, this afternoon, please email tina at waconservationaction.org. That email will be posted in the chat. Having said all of that, I am sure you are as ready as I am to hear from our first presenter. So I will hand it off to our facilitator, Miguel Perez Gibson. Miguel is our resident policy expert for all things DNR and has an extensive background as a dyed in the wool forester. Miguel, I will I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Um... Looks like my video is unable to start, but we can, I'm assuming you can still hear me. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, and it's, it's so good to see so many uh, folks on this, uh, at this presentation from far and, and wide and folks I haven't seen or heard of from a long time. So. Hello to all. So yes, thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Miguel Perez Gibson, and I am a Washington Conservation Actions uh, State Forest uh, Policy Advisor. Um, I've been working in the forestry arena for many decades, uh, both as a boots on the ground and person and at the executive level. And I'm really excited about this uh, presentation by Max. We're very lucky to have him on board. I saw a preview of this, and I think we will all learn uh, much more about this uh, topic uh, than we knew previous to this presentation. So as you know, this conference is the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Many of our sessions focus on the intersection between carbon and forest, however, as we all know, forests provide many critical values and benefits beyond forest carbon sequestration and storage. Forests influence climate in a variety of other ways and provide critical ecosystem services that we will need to adapt to a changing climate. If we focus solely on carbon, we will fail to consider many aspects important to ecosystems and communities. Uh, late last year, World Resources Institute and Conservation International published a report entitled, quote, not just carbon, capturing all benefits of forests for stabilizing the climate from local to global scales, close quote. The report and synthesis analysis, this, this report synthesizes an analysis on forest and climate stability globally. We found the report illuminating and reaching out to the authors to explore, uh, reached out to the authors to explore sharing this work as part of the conference. Uh, the report focuses to a large degree on the role of tropical forests and impacts of deforestation. And of course, there are many differences between tropical forests and the temperate forests of the Pacific Northwest. There are some valuable lessons to be learned for those of us at higher latitudes as well. So with that, now let me please um, allow me to introduce our speaker. Uh, Max Wright is a, a geographer in the Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. His background is in remote sensing and geospatial analysis, and over the past 12 years has supported a wide range of conservation efforts, including REDD plus projects, spatial planning and priority setting, and natural capital accounting. His current work focuses on implementing the exponential roadmap for natural climate solutions with the goal of mobilizing actors to enhance the role of natural and managed ecosystems for climate change mitigation. 
Max also supports research on the non-carbon climate regulation services that forests provide at local, regional, and global scales. He holds a BA in geography and a master's in ge ge geographic information science from Clark University. Welcome, Max. Great, thank you so much, Miguel. And I believe I'm going to become the host so I can turn on my video, uh, but that may just take a moment. So I will let, let them get that going. And in the meantime, share my screen. Uh, so you should be able to, to see my presentation at this point. Okay. Yes, it's coming through fine. Great, let's see, is my, is my video running? If not, no. Oh, it is running. Here we go. Okay. You can see me. Um, just just you put a face to uh, to the talk. Well, thank you guys so much um, for having me here at the, uh, the Washington Conservation Action uh, Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Um, I, my name, as, as I said, my name is Max Wright. I'm a geographer at Conservation International, and I'm based here in Seattle, Washington, uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. It's kind of an interesting way to start off the, the carbon science section um, because the, 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 the title of the talk I'll be giving is not just carbon, capturing and valuing all the climate benefits of forests. Um, and so, you know, I, I would also flag that, you know, the work that I do is primarily in the global tropics. So we'll be taking some of those lessons and seeing how they can be applied here in the Pacific Northwest. All right, so the outline of my presentation, just very briefly, I'll start with an introduction to, to set the stage. Um, then we'll talk about these non-carbon effects that we looked at in the report. I'll describe some of the implications for people, policy, and the economy. And then we'll talk about the relevance of these findings uh, in the context of the Pacific Northwest. So starting at the beginning, uh, I, the company I work for is Conservation National. We're an environmental NGO. Uh, we were founded in 1987 with the mission to conserve global biodiversity. Max, um, Max I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the, the presentation slides aren't advancing. Um, oh. I, I think they need to go into presenter mode because right now we're seeing the, the PowerPoint. Oh, let's try that again. Um, have you advanced the outline slide? Still no. Still on the the opening slide. We don't see the outline yet. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna try a different share method. Then I'll just share the full screen. See if here. Stop sharing, and I'll share the full screen. Thank you for flagging that for me. Let's try that again. Okay. Uh, that looks better. Yep. All well, right. Have you you got the the slides? Are they moving? Uh, not moving. Uh, Zoom. All right. <laughs> now they've moved. We're on the outline now. I've moved. Okay, great. I'm just getting constant error messages from Zoom. So. Okay, I guess I'm I'm back now for another attempt. Apologies, everyone, for this <laughs> right. little bit of confusion in the beginning. Let's try that one more time. So we're gonna share screen and we're gonna move right into presenter mode. And oh god. All right, um, okay, I'm in presenter mode. I'm at Conservation National. We can see that. Perfect, let's just, uh, let's run with it and we'll, we'll hope this this holds. All right, so um, as I was saying, you know, Conservation National has offices in 29 countries around the world, primarily in the global tropics. And we work on projects in over a hundred countries, both through our country programs and through our partners. At CI, or Conservation International, we use science, policy, and partnership to conserve the forests, oceans, and wetlands to provide food and water, sustain economies, and regulate climate. 
you know, in the 35 years that CI has been around, we've really expanded our mission moving beyond biodiversity to acknowledge that if you want to do conservation, if you want to conserve those wild places on the earth, you need to build it in coalition with partners and people in those landscapes. And so, you know, the CI's motto you know, more recently is people need nature to thrive. And so the research and the work that we do helps to try to enable that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here in this group, but, um, you know, about the role of nature for climate mitigation. You know, one of the programs that uh, Miguel mentioned, the, my primary program at CI is the Exponential Roadmap for Natural Climate Solutions. And, and what that is, is understanding the, the capacity of nature to deliver, the to deliver on our global climate solutions through protection, restoration, and improved management. And global estimations put it somewhere around 30% of that global solution, how much we need to get to to stay under the Celsius of warming can come through our natural and managed ecosystems. Now, these natural climate solutions that we're working towards focus primarily on either increasing the sequestration of greenhouse gases or reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. However, there are a number of other important roles for climate mitigation and adaptation that ecosystems play. And the, the real innovation of the roadmap of the exponential roadmap for natural climate solutions is it takes these actions, frames them in terms of the actors on the ground who need to, who we need to motivate, who we need to incentivize, and then also the scale at which we need to expand natural climate solutions in order to reach our global goals. But thinking, focusing on the greenhouse gas is only part of the global picture. The other part is around, is around the, the non-carbon benefits. Um, you know, forests effect on climate through non-carbon pathways are increasingly well understood by scientists but consistently they're undervalued by policymakers and decision makers, which is one of the reasons that the World Resources Institute uh, published this report um, last year on not just carbon, capturing all the benefits of forests for stabilizing climates, uh, climate from local to global scales. And this report was authored by Francis Seymour at WRI, uh, Mike Wallison, uh, a colleague of mine at Conservation National, and Aaron Gray, another WRI colleague. Now I'm gonna kind of break down the, the science behind that report and then talk a little bit about some of the, some of the implications of this, of this research. Um, the four, there, essentially, we're gonna dig into four primary non-carbon effects of forests on climate. Now, often when I start, when we start these presentations, my colleague, uh, Mike Wallace, and he likes to start with having everyone close their eyes and imagine that they are in the Amazon rainforest next to a soy field. I feel that, you know, given that we're here in Washington, maybe we can have a little bit of a different exercise. If you can close your eyes and imagine that you are in a forest here in Washington state, walking along a trail, you feel the shade, there's a little bit of light breeze in the air, maybe some moisture, you can smell the terrapines. And as you get to, as you walk down this trail, you go into, you walk into a clear cut area. You continue walking and you feel the temperature rising. The air feels drier and more stale that smell is no longer in the air and you continue walking and you feel that heat on you. And that's the impact of forests on, on local climate, that, that difference between the being under the forest canopy and out in the open. And that's one of the phenomena that we're gonna to discuss today. So you can open your eyes and come back to reality and let's get into the science a bit. So the first non-carbon effect of forests on climate that I'd like to discuss is surface albedo. And surface albedo is essentially the degree to which a surface either absorbs or reflects solar radiation. Um, you know, darker surfaces absorb more of that radiation and then radiate it back out, while light, light darker surfaces will reflect more of that radiation. So when we think about this in, in terms of forests, you know, dark green tree cover actually absorbs more solar radiation than snow cover or crops or bare soil. So it actually contributes to an overall global warming effect. However, where that warming is felt varies significantly. You know, that heat is being uh, absorbed within the, the forest canopy and then radiated back out into the atmosphere. So at the ground level where people are living, we're not feeling those heat effects, even though from a global perspective, the darker albedo of forest will lead to a, a global uh, warming signature, as opposed to a deforested area where you'll have, you know, more of that heat is reflected back out into the atmosphere rather than absorbed and radiated out. But where that heat lands will be at ground level where people live and work. The second non-carbon effect of forests on climate that I'd like to talk about is 
surface roughness and wind circulation. And this is an area that's about an increasing amount of research, but essentially the unevenness of the forest canopy affects wind speed and turbulence, which then lifts heat up and off, off of the forest canopy up in, into the atmosphere and off of the ground. And this is really important. This, this cycling of warm air is really important for, for keeping the, the, re, the local climate cooler. Essentially, you're dissipating that heat across a larger area. Uh, when, when you don't have forest there, you know, they have weaker fluxes of this horizontal movement of, of wind across the, across the earth. And you don't have as much turbulence. Therefore, that air, that warm air stays on the ground where people are and where they work. The third non-carbon effect of forest on climate is evapotranspiration. Um, so we all know that, that uh, the forests and plants uh, absorb and, uh, and, tra tra and evaporate uh, water. You know, the trees draw moisture from deep below the ground and that leaves, um, and then and their leaves and evaporate into that moisture into the atmosphere. And this evaporation uh, creates a cooling impact. I mean, you can think of it a little bit like a, a swamp cooler, you know, kind of an old school swamp cooler, the bucket of water and the fan blowing across it. The process of evaporation actually cools the, the local area. And, um, and that, had, that, that has a kind of a, a local cooling effect, but also the formation of clouds through evapotranspiration leads to increases in top of atmosphere albedo, which can lead to cooling and it's important for moisture cycling in the regional, in a, in a larger region. So when we lose those forests, when we lose those services, what happens is the, the, we have a low amount of evapotranspiration, the area is drier and we don't have that cooling impact um, of that moisture evaporating into the atmosphere. The, the fourth effect that, that we'll talk about and the final effect is kind of a catch-all effect. We call it secondary effects in aerosols. And, um, and that's really about these bio, uh, biogenetic organic compounds, BVOCs, along with all the other things that are kind of coming off of forest, but small particles, chemical compounds, pollen, all these things that trees release that interact with the atmosphere in a number of complex ways. In general, BVOCs have both sometimes have a scattering, sometimes they have an absorbing impact on, on solar radiation, but, but the science is increasingly showing that BVOCs are really important for, for cloud formation, which is important for um, precipitation, but also for albedo. And in general, the BVOCs will have a cooling impact as a, uh, coming off of a forest, as opposed to uh, an ecosystem that's not producing those uh, BVOCs and other aerosols. So the combination of these, of these four um, non-carbon processes interact across multiple spatial scales in, kind of, in complex ways. So if we're looking here, this, is a, this was a figure we developed uh, as, part of the, as part of the report to kind of show how these different non-carbon processes and effects interact. And so we can work through, if you look at the global, let's we'll start at the top of this. And if we look at the global impacts of all of these processes, at the global level, carbon and other greenhouse gases are the dominant um, forcing agent of, of climate change or of, of global warming. You know, and then as we move at that global level, you know, there's also been a lot of work looking at how um, at the global level, albeit changes in albedo uh, lead to global radiative forcing and increased global temperature averages. And then, you know, so as we move into surface roughness, evapotranspiration, BBOCs, they become less significant at the global level. However, as we move down to the regional level, at the regional level, the impact of uh, greenhouse gases and carbon is pretty minimal. Um, you know, that's a, that's a global average. And similarly, albedo is, has, while has some impact, is not as pronounced. But at the regional level, you know, rainfall and cloud formation through evapotranspiration and BBOCs and to a certain extent surface roughness and that upwelling and that turbulent air has a really large impact on uh, regional climate regulation. Um, and this can affect rainfall patterns you know, within kilometers to hundreds or even thousands of kilometers from where those deforestation events are happening. And finally, at the local or national scale, you know, again, uh, the, the carbon impacts are, are, relatively, are relatively small compared to the local temperature impacts. And a lot of that comes from this surface roughness from the evapotranspiration from the albedo. And so that's the, the global or the, excuse me, the local temperature regulating surfaces of these non-carbon effects. And that's really important when we start, as you continue through the presentation to think across these scales as we move from global to regional to national and local. So 
what are some of the implications of these non-carbon effects for people, policy, and the economy? I'd like to highlight some work that was done by uh, colleagues at uh, the Nature Conservancy, TNC, where they looked at tropical deforestation and human heat stress in Southeast Asia. They looked at areas that have been recently deforested or areas uh, near recent areas of deforestation, looked at the population, so those circles represent the population uh, of the number of people affected in these deforested areas. And then the colors of the circles, and move from lighter to darker, is the amount of the, the percentage of the population that lost or that had a reduction by 30 minutes or more of safe working conditions in their day. So if we, you know, if you're familiar with Indonesia, um, you know, the big circles uh, at the bottom center of the screen, that's Sumatra, the province of Riau, which is the, the oil palm capital of Indonesia. You can see that, you know, you have over a million people that have, uh, you know, 40% of which have now have 30 minutes less uh, um, temperatures in the working part of their day. So this is a really interesting finding. And you know what does this mean? So this this heat stress in the tropical areas is multiplied by deforestation. That's what this is telling us. And so you know at the local scale, deforestation can cause local average temperatures and extreme average temperatures to rise significantly. So let's put this all in context. You know oh. Between the pre-industrial era and now, we've had uh, a global average temperature increase of about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now, if we add to that the additional increase in average temperature in tropical areas with nearby deforestation, that's another one degree Celsius. So that, that global average um, near deforested areas is actually a whole degree higher than the, the global average in general. But now those are both kind of these, these average temperatures, average out over across uh, globally across the year. But when we actually start looking at the increase in average daily high temperature in tropical areas near deforestation, it's close to 4.5 degrees Celsius. And this is huge. Um, and this is a huge increase in the average daily high temperature. And, it's be and the reason this is so important is because this is the temperature that people are feeling when they're outside working in these landscapes which is terrible for, for labor and for human health. Um, I'm gonna uh, kind of following up on that uh, Nature Conservancy, that TNC study, um, the, our colleagues interviewed workers who were working in oil palm plantations that were primarily forested or surrounded by forested areas versus oil palm plantations that had been recently cleared or where there was no forest. And they used a mix of surveys and tests um, to track to work to track workers over time, and they found that the people working in the forested areas were had an eight percent greater output. They took forty four percent fewer breaks. They scored a thirty nine percent higher on memory tests. And this is a really interesting study. Like their cognitive people working out in these deforested areas actually had lower cognitive scores after their shifts because of that heat induced stress. And uh, people working in forest had 3.5 times fewer incidents of heat strain. And another really interesting outcome of that study is that people working in cleared areas, when they accounted for these factors and they modeled them into the future, they found that people working in these recently cleared or recently deforested areas had 8% increase in heat attributable all cause mortality. And that is huge. I mean, that is, you know, this is this when we presented this research back in June in Brussels um, for the Land and Carbon Summit. You know, this was a really a, a really big takeaway. Is that you know, this is not only is deforestation impacting productivity and human health, but it's actually killing people. And and we have the evidence to show that. Oh, here we go. All right. So let's see if this works. This is now. I want to talk about another. Okay, great. Another uh, effect is, is the transportation of moisture, is the importance of, of forests and these non-carbon effects for transporting moisture around the globe. And here we have hourly um, satellite data of moisture. The orange is areas that are, are raining and the, the whites and grays are, are cloud cover. And you can see these daily pulses across the, across the forested areas of the world, especially if you zoom, if you look you know, at the Amazon rainforest, we have this, this daily pulse of, of orange, of rain, and that's coming down into the Sahado and to the country south of Brazil to feed that soy and cattle belt that feeds a lot of the world. Um, you know, I, 
I, I really like this graphic a lot because I think it, it really shows the interconnectedness of all of the, especially these atmospheric rivers and the importance of forests in maintaining those flows. Uh, let's pause this and keep, keep on trucking. Um, so, you know, the takeaway here is that tropical deforestation not only threatens, you know, um, you know, local health and, and working conditions, but also threatens crop yields. There was a study that was done that um, looked at the lost revenue from soy cultivation and beef production in the southern Brazilian Amazon through 2050 in a high deforestation versus a low deforestation scenario. And they found that just by changing the amount of deforestation, the lost revenue to the Brazilian Am to the Brazil agricultural sector would be about $186 billion because of reduced, uh, you know, reductions in, in their production and, um, and, and, and lower yields uh, due, to, due to increased temperatures. In that same study, they also looked at what would be the cost of reducing deforestation, the conservation cost to, of a low deforestation scenario. And they found that the cost is just under $20 billion. And so it's, it's kind of statistics like this, it's thinking about forests as providing uh, more benefits than just you know, global climate regulation. Forests are also providing climate stability that enables agricultural production and incomes. And you know, statistics like this one, looking at the, the lo potential lost revenue of a, of a high deforestation scenario versus the cost, opportunity cost of conserving a low deforestation scenario, um, you know, provides All right. I apologize to everyone. It seems like we've run into uh, some connectivity issues with Max. Hopefully he will be back here in just a second. Um, but we are reaching out to him to try and get him back on. So please stand by. Oh, here he is. Oh, no. Did I? How long have I been out? Uh, probably about 35 seconds or so. OK. OK, that's not too bad. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, let's go back one. Uh, Really quickly, in case you missed this bit, the key message here, there's a lot, you know, deforestation can lead to a massive reduction in agricultural productivity, and that could cost Brazil 190, almost $190 billion by 2050, the cost to conserve less than 20. Max, yes. can you bring up your presentation again, please? Oh, oh goodness, yep. Let me... All right, sorry about, am I not sharing screen or is it just sharing something else now? Okay, um, you should see the presentation. Uh, yep, we have it not in uh, presenter mode though. Yeah, I'm gonna. Okay. Pull. All right, so you should be in presenter mode. Can you, am my slides moving? They are not. Not right now. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry, everyone. Bring it all try one more time. Okay, have you guys got slides now? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, I'm so sorry about this. Um, no worry, we, we're having some technical <laughs> difficulty on our end too, so don't. All right, we'll try mind. it again and, and see. There we go. Have... Okay, so we're back. Uh, hopefully this holds. If not, I'll just, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> All right. To presenter mode. Okay. 
hyper mode. Hopefully y'all can, can see my screen and I will continue on. Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully I'm back now. Apologies for that. Let's share the screen and see if we can't get this up and running for everyone. Can can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we can. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. OK, we're going into presenter mode. Hopefully, it does not crash. And let's get going. OK, policies, local and national scales, adaptation, protecting workers, and agricultural productivity. At national to regional scales, there are a number of different policy implications especially when we think about these transboundary atmospheric rivers and the, and the movement of precipitation. There's been a lot of work linking deforestation in Brazil to reduce agricultural production in the Sahado and Uruguay and areas south of Brazil. Um, and so understanding these pathways can be really important for these international, these transnational uh, negotiations. And finally, at the global level, there are a number of policy implications. You know, a lot of the global picture around reducing um, or mitigating global warming has focused on the reduction of greenhouse gases. However, you know, there are a number of other mechanisms that we should probably start building into the UNFCCC discussions to, um, enhance the role of tropical forests for, for climate mitigation. So moving back to the global perspective, this is a great figure that, uh, that we printed in a report um, by Lawrence et al. in 2022 that actually breaks down the impacts of all these uh, both non-carbon and carbon impacts of forests per 10 degree latitude. So this was a modeling exercise in which they essentially deforested all the forest within each 10 degree latitude, ran that through a global atmospheric model to understand what would be the impacts uh, in terms of global warming or cooling and how the different um, carbon and non-carbon effects would play out. And so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of focus you in on a few key areas here. In this graph to the left, um, the two big ones you should be looking at are uh, albedo in orange and then CO2 in blue. And then all the other, um, non-carbon non benefits in, in the other colors. When we kind of stack up all of those biophysical or the non-carbon effects and then the CO2 effects, you see that here in the middle, um, you know, in the tropics, both of those, you know, the deforestation leads to overall warming, net warming across both. As we move up into the temperate zone, that picture becomes a little less clear. It's unclear whether, and this is a really interesting point, is that where is that shift where the biophysical, the non-carbon effects will have a global warming impact um, as opposed to a global cooling impact. And here on the far right, we show those the net impact, essentially stacking these um, these bars to show you know what would be if you deforce all of that area, what is the net impact? And it's worth flagging that you know these results are very much a modeled exercise at a global level. So you know no one is suggesting that we should deforest all of our boreal forests in order to fight climate change. That's ridiculous. Um, but it does provide a better understanding, or at least shows some of the nuances on how the, the effects, the non-carbon effects of forests can vary depending on where they are. And that's a really important uh, takeaway. Um, you know, the kind of the, the, the end of the report, the big conclusion was that, you know, tropical forests full cooling effect could be, um, you know, about 50% more than just the carbon effect itself. So when we deforest an area, the warming from carbon you know, there could be an additional 
from the loss of these non-carbon climate services. And that's, you know, that 50% number is a bit of an estimation, you know, it could be 30, it could be 60, but the science is pretty uh, well aligned that, you know, what it is is there's this added cooling benefit of non-carbon uh, effects in tropical forests. So what does this mean for, for what is the relevance of this for non-tropical forests and for global conservation and for the Pacific Northwest? Um, I think one of the key takeaways is that we need a better quantification of these non-carbon effects on global climate. You know, the results of this report focused on the global tropics in part because that's where we have the best data uh, and, our, and where we can draw these conclusions. And that's also where there's the greatest opportunity for global climate mitigation. However, again, that's at that global level, at regional and local levels, there's still a need for more robust understanding of how these non-carbon effects uh, play out in temperate and boreal zones. You know, the science is very much, um, is very out on, on, what, on where, what is the exact impact of these non-carbon services as we move outside of the tropics. Some studies say that these provide an overall net cooling benefit, some a net warming benefit, but there is a lot of uncertainty there and being able to, to break up that uncertainty and reduce it will allow us to better incorporate these non-carbon effects into our planning. Um, you know, another important aspect here is that, you know, the impacts of forest and mansion practices on non-carbon effects in the tropical zone is particularly important and not as well understood. And you know, compared to the, the tropical zone in the temperate zone, excuse me, uh, you know, a lot of those forests in the temperate zone are managed forests. Um, and so understanding how different management practices, the impact of those different management practices on non-CO2 effects can be really important from a, from a conservation and a, and, a, and a regional management perspective. You know, despite the fact that the, you know, there are some uncertainties as we move out of the tropics into the temperate and the boreal zones, there are some er there are a few points in which you know, the scientific community aligns. And one of the key ones is that locally at all latitudes, forest biophysical impacts or, or non-carbon impacts far await CO2 effects in promoting local climate stability by reducing extreme temperatures in all seasons and all times of day. And this is extremely important. I mean, the, the takeaway here is that regardless of what that net global warming or cooling benefit is across all latitudes, we know that these non-carbon effects um, promote, they essentially reduce the, ex the temperature extremes uh, on a daily and seasonal basis. And the reason that's so important is because those extremes are the things that drive biodiversity extinction events, those when you move outside of your thermal, those thermal thresholds for specific species, those are changes in seasonality which affect agriculture or changes in the a number of safe working hours that people can be outside. So although the global impacts of the cumulative effects may be less understood in temperate and boreal zones, the local impacts are very well understood and we know that they're important for climate stability. Um, you know, forests also minimize the risk of drought associated with extreme with heat extremes, and they regulate the moisture cycling. Again, this is an effect that we know is is really important. And regardless if it's in the tropics, the boreal, or the temperate zones, the forest through that uh, moisture regulation, you know, provide um, increased resilience against extreme temperature events, um, which are only going to increase on, with climate change into the future. So, considering these non-carbon effects is critical to understanding the role of forests in the Pacific Northwest for uh, local and regional climate stability. Finally, um, just, Max, just uh, where we need to probably within a couple minutes. Last up. slide, perfect timing. All right, um, thank you. And apologies again for all this technical difficulty, guys. No worries. Thank you for sticking with me. My key message is just to end, uh, to end the talk here is, you know, the non-carbon effects of forest on climate are critical for local and regional climate stability and for climate action. It can be very difficult motivating, motivating actors, motivating people to care about gigatons at a global scale for 0.5 degrees. It just, the message gets lost, but people do understand when they're, when they're local, when the places they live, the places they're familiar with, and the impacts on those places from these, uh, from, are impacted by climate from these non-carbon uh, effects. You know, there is a need for additional research uh, to understand the impacts of forest management practices on non-carbon effects. And this is extremely important when we're talking about um, the temperate zone specifically and, and why I'm so excited to be presenting this research to this group specifically. 
And then finally, you know, incorporating these effects into conservation planning can improve both our climate and our ecological outcome. So thinking about this as a full picture um, when we're doing, when we're planning and managing these ecosystems um, can lead to, to lead to greater resilience and, uh, and better outcomes into the future. So with that, I will, I'll wrap up here and I'll open the floor for questions. Um, thank you very much. If you'd like to reach out, um, my email is here and I also have a link to view those reports. Thanks, uh, Max. Um, and maybe you could uh, stop sharing your screen. There we go. Um, I'm still having a little difficulty starting my video, but um, I'm here. But you're here. Uh, well, thanks so much. Uh, I will just say there are so many levels of uh, of to your presentation. Um, I will see what questions we have queued up for you, but I'd like to ask one myself right off the bat. Um, it seems like the subtext here uh, is a, is about how the, the 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 four components you mentioned around the forest and the local and global and regional scales that um, that they can uh, influence heat. Uh, seems to be, I mean, we, we talk about global warming, but heat, um, and I'm reminded by a, a recent a book in the New York Times bestseller list at the moment, I think it's called The Heat Will Kill You First by uh, Jeff Goodall. You're he's nodding your head as you're familiar yep. with that. And, um, you know, he, he uh, you know, points out the most vulnerable, you know, sick and vulnerable and older. Um, and the 2021 heat wave we had in the Pacific Northwest, I think the temperatures got up to 116 degrees in Canada, and they reported something like 400 deaths. And in Washington, I think it was 160 deaths. But just the ability to have those forest components within our urban settings uh, would, would be um, enough in itself to consider the other benefits of forest management. So would you mind just speaking to that piece and how your work has been received with regarding dealing with the, the dangers of extreme heat? Yeah, no, that's, it's a great, it's a great point. And I think there's a few, a few components of your question that I'd like to kind of dig into. I think one of them is this idea of heat, of moving the conversation away from concentrations of greenhouse gases to heat on the ground. Heat at two meters has become the new metric by which we're, we measure our success towards combating uh, global warming. And so I think that's really important. That reframing as a global community has been really important. Thinking about heat within, you know, dealing with extreme heat events and the impacts of forests, um, you know, this research is, is, is very much, you know, kind of, kind of a broad picture, large deforestation, but at that local level, it's so important. And there's actually been some really interesting work that's been done looking at the heat regulation uh, value of urban forests um, across the United States. And if people are interested, I'd be happy to send along some of that research. But they found that, you know, in that research, they looked at the um, how the level to which urban green space, uh, leaf area index in urban areas can influence the um, the amount of heat or, or the heat regulation within urban areas. And then they actually went one step further and then value those services based on the costs that it would be to, you know, for example, power air conditioning to offset that heat. And so that's, I think it's a really interesting study. And I think as we move to a world where we are, where we're going to have more of these extreme climate events, extreme heat events, it's all the more important to think about how we can utilize natural climate solutions and forests into, um, you know, it kind of is, is part of our, not just mitigation strategy, but our adaptation strategy. And those two, I think for a long time, the scientific community was either mitigation or adaptation. And now I think we really have moved to point where we really need to be thinking about mitigation and adaptation going hand in hand. Thanks so much. We're ru running out of time, but I'm going to ask, uh, we have a question from, from the audience. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, what additional research you feel would be valuable for us to better understand the role of forest management in our climate? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, you know, as I alluded to in the presentation, an area that I think there's a lot of promise is around how can we better, um, you know, a lot of the work that we're looking at has been kind of the, the destruction, the deforestation of, of non-managed forests, not working forests. And I think an area that would be really interesting that I would love to learn more about um, is how can specific forest management practices what is the impact of various forest management practices on these non-carbon effects? And can we start to quantify those so that we can start thinking about them alongside, you know, carbon accounting, carbon sequestration as part of a kind of a, 
a landscape of climate resilience and climate stability. Um, so for me, I think that management component would be an area that, that I'm really interested to learn more about, especially in the context of the Pacific Northwest. Well, very, very good. Well, um, so if you would just plug that report again and how people can get a hold of it, not just carbon, uh, where is that available? Uh, those, the not just carbon report and the exponential roadmap for natural climate solution report are both available online. I'll throw the links to both of those in the chat. And it looks like someone would also be interested in the urban uh, forestry uh, paper that I had mentioned that I worked on previously, so I can send that in as well. Max, can't thank you enough. It was really, really good. I, you've got us all thinking about the other benefits to forests besides the carbon sequestration benefits. So thank you very much. And um, folks, we're going to take about 10 minutes break and we'll set up for our next presentation. Uh, Yep, get a snack, skin some water, stretch your legs, and we'll see you back on the other side around 2.05. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>